at his first meeting. Accordingly, at this organization meeting, we have the following measures on the table, the rules of organization and procedure for the Community and Recreation Library and Youth Affairs for Council Period 25, Resolution of 2023, and the Committee on Recreation Library Youth Affairs Appointment Resolution of 2023. First, we would consider the vote on the committee rules as stated in the Council Rules 226. The committee staff drafted the rules and organization consistent with the rules and applicable laws to govern the procedures in the committee. To that end, uh, the rules meet the requirements. Uh, is there any discussions on this matter? All right, hearing. Hearing none, I move to draft the rules of organization procedures for the Committee on Recreation, Library, and Youth Affairs for Council Period 25, Resolution of 2023, and the underlying resolutions will leave for staff to make technical and forming changes. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Well, thank you. We also joined by at-large council member, Kenny McDuffie. I gotta get used to saying at-large. Um, thank you for joining. Um, anyone opposed signify by saying nay. Hearing none, the ayes have it. Second, we will vote on the staff appointment resolution. I move the draft committee on uh, recreation, library, and youth affairs, uh, staff appointment resolution of 2023. Are there any discussion on this matter? Hearing none, all in favor by signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Signify by saying nay. Okay, we have a unanimous vote and the ayes have it. Um, we will reconvene in two minutes to mark up PR 25-0019, Director of Office of Cable Television, Film, Media, and Entertainment, Latoya Foster, Confirmation Resolution of 2023. This meeting is adjourned. We start in four seconds. Council members. It's off as a cable and television ready. Somebody can put a thumbs up in the chat or
Dr. Hoskins, can you check and see if um, Officer Cable Television is ready? Yes, I will. Thank you so much. Okay, they're ready. All right, I'm gonna start in 30 seconds. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Treyon White, and I serve as the council member and chair on the Committee on Recreation, Libraries, and Youth Affairs. Um, today is January the, the 31st, 2023. Wow. And we are meeting remotely using the Zoom platform and on YouTube. Uh, the time is now 2.48 p.m., and I'm calling to order this additional meeting uh, for the committee. Uh, for the record, um, uh, we have a quorum with the presence of uh, War One Council Member Brianna Doe, uh, at large Council Member Anita Bonds, and also at large Council Member uh, Kenyon McDuffie. Today we have the following resolution under consideration, PR 25-0019, Director of Cable Television, Film, Media and Entertainment, Latoya Foster, Confirm Confirmation Resolution of 2023. PR 25-0019, Director of Office of Cable Television, Film, Media, Entertainment, Latoya Foster Confirmation Resolution of 2023 was introduced by Councilmember Mendelson at the request of Mayor Bowser on November 10th, 2022, and was referred to the committee on November the 15th, 2022. The committee had a public roundtable on November the 21st, um, and all testimony was favorable of her appointment. Um, is there any discussion? On this matter? Hearing none, I move the committee for print and report PR 25 0019, Director of Office of Cable Television, Film, Media, Entertainment, Toya Foster, Confirmation Resolution of 2023. We leave uh, for a staff to make technical and conforming changes. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Um, those opposed signify by saying no. Hearing none, the ayes have it unanimously. Uh, with no other further, further business before this committee, the committee is concluded. The time is now 2.49 p.m. Um, and this meeting is adjourned. Please note we will reconvene today um, for the public oversight hearing on Officer African American Affairs, Office of uh, African American African American Affairs, uh, Office of Asian and Pacific Islander Affairs and Office of Father, Men and Boys. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thanks. Take care. Thank you.
Start in 30 seconds. Good afternoon. I'm Treon White, a Ward 8 Council Member, also the Chair for Recreation, Library, and Youth Affairs. Uh, today is Tuesday, January the 31st, 2023. We are meeting remotely using the Zoom platform, and I believe we are still live on Facebook and live on YouTube. The time is now 2.53 p.m., and I'm calling to order this public hearing on the agency of on oversight for the Mayor's Office of African-American Affairs, Mayor's Office of African, I'm sorry, Mayor's Office on African-American Affairs, Mayor's Office on African Affairs, the Mayor's Office on Asian and Specific Islander Affairs, and the Mayor's Office on Father, Fathers, Men and Boys. Today's hearing will have both public and government witnesses. The mission of the Mayor's Office on African Affairs is to ensure that African immigrants have access to full range of information and services offered by DC to support their local and economic development. The mission of the Mayor's Office on African American Affairs is to build relationships with government agencies, community-based organizations, and local businesses to ensure that African Americans have access to resources to stay and thrive in the district. The mission on the, of the Mayor's Office on Asian and Pacific Islander Affairs is to improve the quality of life for DC Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders through advocacy and engagement. The mission for the mayor's office on father, men and boys to seek and address disparities that adversely affect men and boys of color in Washington, DC. Each office provides needed supports for their community. I look forward to hearing from witnesses. Um, I see Councilmember Bonds is still here. Councilmember Bonds, would you, do you have an opening statement? If not, we will just continue. Okay, hearing none, thank you. Um, I will call the first panel of witnesses. Uh, you will be promoted to the audience to be on the panel. Um, if my staff can stop promoting you guys now, Karen Kwok. Um, all public witnesses appearing on their own behalf will be allowed a maximum of three minutes to testify. Any public witness that's a part of an organization or advisory neighborhood commissioner will have five minutes to testify. So the first public witness we have is Karen Kwok. And help me if I mispronounce pronounce your name. It's Karen here. Okay. Karen is not present, I don't okay. believe. All right, thank you for that information, Dr. Hoskins. Um, next, we will have the government witnesses beginning with the Mayor's Office on African American Affairs and Director Ali Kaba. Um, if we can elevate Director Kaba, that would be beautiful. Kyle, are you able to elevate the witness? Okay, there he's done, he's there, all right. If you can cut your screen on. Uh, we begin all of our hearings by swearing all government witnesses. All right. Give me one second.
All right, you can start by raising your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give today uh, is the truth and nothing but the truth? You are mute. Nah. Yeah. I do. There we go. All right, you can start with your opening statement if you have one. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Chairperson White, members of the Committee on Recreation, Libraries and Youth Affairs, and member of the public. My name is Ali Kaba, and I'm the Executive Director of the Mayor's Office on African Affairs, also known as MOAA. Today, I'm pleased to testify before the committee about the Mayor's Office on African Affairs accomplishment for the fiscal year 2021 and fiscal year 2022. First, I want to thank the mayor Mayor Bowser for her leadership and commitment to supporting the district African community, especially during the unprecedented time. It is an honor for MOAA to serve the African community in the district, participate in effort to mitigate the effect of COVID-19 on our residents and ensure that every resident on the district has access to the middle class. At MOAA, we are proud of what the team and I and the African Affairs Commission members have done to bring quality programs to the African community in the district. Through our six program areas, MOAA ensured that the district growing African communities continue to take full advantage of the wide range of services the District of Columbia government offers. Partnership has been a crucial part of our event, program, outreach, activities, and initiatives we are engaged in throughout the fiscal years 21-22 today. I want to take this opportunity to explain some of these events, programs, outreach activities, and initiatives. To support Mayor Bowser's commitment to public safety in the district, MOA partner with the Metropolitan Police Department to conduct weekly targeted outreach activities to African businesses, community-based organizations, and residential areas across all eight wards. These outreach activities aim to address the long-term public safety concern associated with cultural and language barrier, lack of understanding, and fear of law enforcement by some community members. In FY22, MOAA entered a collaborative agreement with the Department of Energy and Environment to help 80 African low to moderate income families enroll in the Solar for All program. By providing funding support to local community organizations under its African Community Development Grant Program, in FY22, MOAA served over 10,000 residents around immigration, economic and workforce development, health and human services, youth engagement, and the promotion of arts, culture, and humanities. MOA provided policy advice and technical support to over 15 DC government agencies with critical public contact, such as the Department of Employment Services, the Department of Human Services, DC Health Link, DC Public Schools, the Metropolitan Police Department, the Department of Health, DOEE, and more. MOA supported agencies' effort to develop and update develop, update, and monitor the implementation of the language access plan in the context of COVID-19. In November 2021, the Mayor's Office on African Affairs in collaboration with the Department of Mental Health and the Mayor's Office on Religious Affairs hosted a community conversation about mental health among African residents in the district. This allowed residents to learn more about mental health issues and help them access how mental health problems affect their communities. The event opened the space for an open and honest dialogue on mental health and help reduce the secrecy associated with mental illness. In November 2021, MOA partnered with the DC Women Business Center, the DC Small Business Administration Center, the National Community Reinvestment Coalition, and MNT Bank for the How to Start a Business webinar held in French and Amharic. This webinar aimed to add 
prospective African women entrepreneurs by providing insight and resources to launch their businesses successfully. In December 2021, MOAA collaborated with the Office of Tenant Advocate for a Know Your Right Tenant's Right workshops in French and Amharic. The workshop covered COVID-19 impact on tenants' rights, including rent payment plans, rent increases, and available rent assistance, such as Mayor Bowser's state DC program. In February 2022, MOA, in collaboration with the Department of Insurance, Securities, and Banking, and the Mayor's Office on Community Affairs sister agencies, held a free tax preparation event connecting low-income and moderate-income district residents to virtual tax preparation services. These services serve over 50 African residents. In March 2022, in, in celebration of Women's History Month, the Mayor's Office on African Affairs in partnership with St. Gabriel Ethiopian Orthodox Church, the Ethiopian Nurses Association, and the Mayor's Office on Women Policies an initiative hosted a health and wellness fair. This was an opportunity to connect over 200 district residents with health and wellness information. In addition, there were over 120 residents that received essential health care screening. In April 2022, the Mayor's Office on African Affairs in collaboration with the Mayor's Office on Latino Affairs and Asian and Pacific Islander Affairs Language Access Team hosted the bilingual job fair as part of the Workforce Development Service. This was an opportunity to connect DC residents to jobs in their languages. Residents was connect, were connected to employment in the private sector, nonprofit organization, and government agencies. In April 2022, the Mayor's Office on African Affairs in partnership with the Deputy Mayor's Office for Planning and Economic Development participated in the 2022 Diaspora Investment Meeting at the Ghana Embassy. This event was part of a series of meetings across various cities in the United States, organized by the Ghana Investment Promotion Center in partnership with the Embassy of Ghana and the American Chamber of Commerce. This initiative was to promote trade and investment between the two countries, as well as to match diaspora and U.S. investor to local entrepreneurs in Ghana. To celebrate May 25th as Africa Day in Washington, D.C., MOA partnered with the African Union Mission to the USA to celebrate the 59th anniversary of the Organization of the African Unity, African Union, and welcome new ambassadors from the Republic of Malawi, Niger, Republic of Cote d'Ivoire, the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. In June 22, MOA in partnership with the Metropolitan Police Department and the Mayor's Office of Community Affairs hosted the 2022 annual DC Community Soccer Tournament. The goal of this event was to constructively engage and recognize the district African communities to celebrate immigrant heritage and build trust and partnership between MPD and the resident in the district. The event attracted over 300 DC African residents. In early June, the, the country Cameroon was designated TPS, Temporary Protected Status. In this effect, the Office of African Affairs partnered with the African community together, an IGLS grantee to host a Know Your Right and legal clinic for community members needing assistance. In July 22, we partner with the Mayor's Office on Nightlife and Culture and DC Small Business Development Center at Howard University to host an intro to industry workshop for prospective nightlife entrepreneurs. The workshop featured presentation and resources from DC agencies like the Department of Consumer and Regulatory Affairs, the Alcoholic Beverage Regulation Administration, DC Health and more. In August 22, MOA in partnership with the Mayor's Office of Racial Equity hosted an engagement forum to gain ideas and feedback on African residents to help shape the district's first racial equity action plan, a roadmap for reducing inequities and improving life of all Washingtonians. On September 22, to kick off the African Heritage Month celebration, 
the Mayor's Office on African Affairs sponsor to African Community Grant Program, the Kankuran West African Dance Company for their 39th annual concert at Howard University. The concert featured artists, musicians, drummer and dancer spanning dozens of countries throughout Africa and its diaspora, highlighting the vast culture of West Africa. For fiscal year 2022, 2023, we will continue to work steadily on building stronger collaboration and partnership with DC agencies to strengthen our agency's program and initiatives to serve African residents in the district and promote their economic development. We look forward to supporting Mayor Bowser's grand vision to keep Washington, D.C. as a city where people from all work, all background of life, thrive, and have access to the middle class. In closing, I would like to thank my team, Director of Operation, Gelila Getani, our Community Outreach Liaison, Amina Tanjai, our Language Access Coordinator, Yared Mengistu, our Grand Management Specialist, Semhal Hagos, for their tireless work and dedication to the African community and the city. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to answering any question you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Director, for your testimony, um, seeing you out in the field working. Um, I'm unable to, um, I don't know if you were able to make it to um, the screening for uh, Woman King, uh, but we were joined by one of the princes of Benin, um, King Dennis Asogaba, um, which was very enlightening and, and inspiring for uh, DC residents, for the king to come here, for the prince to come here and speak, uh, hosted by, I believe, um, William Locker's foundation uh, at, at uh, Rooster Glory and also the Washington former. Um, and so I wanna thank you for your leadership. And we wanna figure out ways we can be supportive to you and other agencies under my committee. So director, I'm going to go into questions. Uh, in your testimony, you stated that you partnered with MPD um, to conduct weekly targeted outreach activities for African businesses and community-based organizations and residential areas across all eight wards. Uh, what kind of outreach activities uh, did you guys do? Right. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, so the mayor's office on African affairs worked closely with MPD. Actually, we have uh, an African liaison unit that was created uh, within MPD in uh, 2016. So the role of this unit is to coordinate grassroots outreach activities with uh, the Mayor's Office on African Affairs outreach team uh, to engage with uh, the businesses uh, and uh, the, the different families across the eight world. Uh, our actions uh, were concentrated recently in World 4 and World 1, where you have a concentration of uh, African residents in the district. So the goal here is really to have the, the this liaison unit present in the African community create that familiarity that will uh, allow residents facing different challenges just to reach out to them uh, to seek help. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, I also want to know, uh, did you find any, did you get any effective feedback um, about uh, police community relations as relates to the African community here in the district? Uh, any positive, negative, or just thoughts? Uh, because, you know, as we see what's happening um, in Memphis, even all across the country, it's important that uh, us as government leaders uh, serve as buffers. And I just want to know from you, Director, uh, is there any feedback from the community that we should know or be informed about? Uh, not as of now. Um, we have been really uh, present in the community. Our action of always been preventive. Um, in addition to the grassroots outreach we conduct, we also organize yearly uh, soccer tournament with MPD. Mm -hmm. uh, we bring the community and the police officers together around uh, different 
soccer match. Uh, so so far the relationship has been has been good. Um, nothing to report on that so far. Got you. Um, I know one of the things I run into all the time uh, as it relates to education for our youth and, and even our adults is the language barriers. Um, do you hear uh, from uh, from any of our parents or students about any language barriers as it relates to them trying to get a quality education here in the district? Right. Uh, language barrier and uh, language and cultural barrier are the two main uh, challenges, two main obstacles to the social integration of uh, African residents uh, in the district. We have uh, uh, over 16,000 African immigrants in the district and over 42% of that population is limited or non-English uh, proficient. We have a fifth of that population, so 20% of African immigrants in the district that live in a linguistically isolated household where uh, no one aged 14 speak English, uh, okay. at least very well. So language access has always been the main barrier that will uh, stop African residents and students from unleashing their full potential. In, do you uh, are there any um i guess dominant or consistent languages that you see that we should be thinking about creating more bridges for um indeed uh amharic will be the main one because uh we have over 40 percent of the african immigrant population in dc that was born in uh in ethiopia and the Ethiopian population doubled since 2000. Between 2000 and 2016, the uh -huh. second uh, largest country of origin is uh, Nigeria, followed by uh, Cameroon, then Ghana. Uh -huh. So the, the need is mainly, from what we have observed, for Amharic and French. OK, got it. Um... In testimony, uh, you also stated that by providing funding support for African American grant community grantees in FY 21 and 22, uh, the mayor's office of African Affairs served over 10,000 residents around immigration, economic and workforce development, health and human services, youth engagement, uh, et cetera. Uh, how were you able to measure uh, the outcomes from these efforts? Right. Um, we work closely with our different grantees. First, we, we conduct uh, quarterly uh, evaluation with them, quarterly meetings, where we go, where we go over, uh, we monitor the implementation of the, the, different, uh, the different programs. Uh, more than that, we partner with them, we organize, event, giving them our platform to reach uh, a larger uh, a larger group in the community. So if we consider their network, in addition to, to ours, we are able to, to reach the, a, a larger community in district, uh, in the district. And what would you say that uh, some of the main focuses uh, of the grantees, what, what do they do? I know it's a variety of them, but if you can list for me what some of the things that they do would be helpful. So we have uh, the many grantees focus on immigration. As you know, the mayor has a 3.5 immigration justice legal services grant program mm -hmm. that we, we use to help newcomers in the district. Um, we have grantees that provide health services, uh, job and workforce development. We also have a multicultural awareness and community development. So we sponsor a community-based organization that hosts a cultural event and a, a festival just to showcase the richness of uh, the African uh, community here in the district. So we provide funds to 
community-based organizations that have programs in uh, aligned with the mayor's priorities in the area of health, education, uh, public safety, job and workforce development, and so on. Got you. Um, one of the things I am concerned about is I'm in and out of conversations with people every day from different walks of life, different ethnicities, different backgrounds, different age groups, different economic statuses, uh, is the mental health of the people in the district, right? Um, does the agency uh, partner with any other government agency to address any uh, issues related to health, especially mental health among African residents in the district? Right, uh, we host yearly events, uh, several events with uh, DBH, Department of Behavioral Health. Mm -hmm. uh, we usually partner with the Mayor's Office of African American Affairs and also restore returning citizens, just to ensure that our community members or the different constituents we're serving have access to uh, the different mental health services offered, offered by the district. Uh, we, we know this subject is usually very taboo. Uh, so the mayor's office on African affairs uses his uh, cultural competency to approach community members and uh, share information about the mental health uh, service providers and ensure that they know where to reach them. So we also conduct aggressive outreach uh, to ensure our community members participate in the different events we host and to, to get the information they need. Thank you. And I know you uh, collaborated with Disby um, and MOCA to provide a, a free tax preparation event uh, that served over 50 African residents. Uh, can you give me some ideas and thoughts and takeaways from the event and how you think it went? Right, uh, the idea of hosting this event came from uh, the Commission on African Affairs as they are an extension of our office in the community. Uh, this was taken from a, an assessment of need we conducted with them in the community and community members uh, raised the need of uh, hosting such an event. So it was a pretty successful event as we provided uh, language access support in French and Amharic. As I just mentioned, we have uh, over 35 uh, uh, household, African household that are limited or non-English proficient. So this was a, a really helpful event that we intend to, to do yearly. Okay. We got that. Um, I just want to know, uh, I know we are still in a pandemic, but it's not as heightened as, as it once was, and we're getting out more as a government and opening up more. Uh, what are some of your strategies to, to out, do outreach in the community? Uh, and, and, and are you, how is your staff integrated with that? Are you using partners? Could you give us an idea of how uh, the office is making itself available to those who may not know that this office even exists? Right. Uh First, we have a community outreach team, a community and language access support team that conduct uh, grassroots outreach uh, weekly in the community. We have uh, a newsletter that reaches over uh, 60,000 uh, subscribers in the district. We work closely with our grantees, so community-based organization that receive uh, funds under the African Community Development Grant Program, and they provide linguistically and culturally targeted services to uh, community members. Um, we also have our different social media platform that we use to reach out to the community. But also we work closely with faith-based organizations. In the district, we have created a really solid relationship with them and that helps us to widen our reach in the community. Um, what else? We also make calls, weekly calls to community members using our, our database, and that has been uh, really helpful uh, to, to us. But we also organize uh, cultural events, appealing events to the community. 
that uh, we capitalize on by inviting. Partnership is really crucial to this. So we partner with DC government agencies that provide vital services to our community members. And we uh, create this platform where community members can meet with service provider, providers around cultural events. Thank you. Um, I think you answered a few of my questions in, in that uh, response. And I guess finally, um, my, one of my final uh, questions is uh, about the feedback um, around the district's first racial equity action plan. Um, and that plan is a roadmap for reducing inequities and improving life for Washingtonians. Uh, what kind of involvement and or feedback did you receive or participate in to add value to this, if any? Right, uh, so we, organized uh, a meeting with the Office of uh, Racial Equity and Community Members. We conducted outreach, an aggressive outreach uh, for them to collect feedbacks directly with community members. And in addition to that, we provided uh, the 2018 State of the Immigrant Report in the district that was prepared by the Urban Institute uh, that gives the characteristic of African immigrant uh, in, the, in the district when it comes to the demographic, the economic opportunity uh, they present, um, including um, the number of African residents in the labor force, uh, the unemployment rates, also just every characteristic that can uh, represent economic opportunities or challenges faced by African immigrants in the district. Got it. Well, thank you, Director. Uh, we look forward to uh, working together to ensure we are growing uh, as a government and being more efficient with our services and making sure we are inclusive in our resources in the district. If you have any uh, need of me, please feel free to reach out to me and on my staff and your staff as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Councilman. Thank you. Now we will move uh, over. Give me one second to switch screens. Now we move over to the mayor's office of African American Affairs. Let me make sure I'm in the right order. My staff can correct me if I'm wrong. I have a, a lot of notes here. Oh, is that Director Bowen? Yes, sir. Okay, we'll move on over to the office of African American Affairs and Father Men, Fathers, Men, and Boys. Uh, good afternoon, Director Bowen. You can start with your opening statement. Oh, let me swear you in real quick. I apologize. You start with your right hand. Uh, do you swear or affirm on the penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give today is the truth and nothing but the whole truth? I did. Thank you so much. Go right ahead. Good afternoon, Chairman White, members of the Committee on Recreation, Libraries, and Youth Affairs, staff, and residents of the District of Columbia. My name is Reverend Thomas Bowen. I'm here as the Director of African American Strategic Engagement in the Executive Office of Mayor Bowser. In this role, I manage two offices and three commissions, the Mayor's Office on African American Affairs, the Mayor's Office of Religious Affairs, the Commission on Fallen Men and Boys, the Commission on African American Affairs, and the Mayor's Interfaith Council. I wanna thank Mayor Bowser for placing this trust in me. It is an honor to lead the Mayor's African-American Community Engagement focused on DC hope, health, opportunity, prosperity, and equity. Today, I'll discuss the accomplishments and activities of the Mayor's Office on African-American Affairs and the Commission on Fallen Men and Boys during fiscal year 2022, FY22. Later, tomorrow, I will appear before the Committee on Public Works and Operations to discuss the work of the Mayor's Office of Religious Affairs and the Mayor's Interfaith Council. 
This past summer, I had the wonderful privilege to serve on the Black Home Ownership Strike Force. Some may consider the task of addressing decades of racial discriminatory policies and practices that have hampered access to one of the most significant ways to build wealth for Black families, home ownership, a difficult, if not impossible one. But I, like Mayor Bowser, saw it as important and necessary. The work of my office in fiscal year 2023 will build upon the work of FY22 to ensure the success of Mayor Bowser's ambitious plan for our city that will help Black residents thrive. We can achieve 20,000 additional Black DC residents homeowners by 2030. We can grow the median income of Black households by $25,000. We can make sure that all residents east of the Anacostia River live within a mile of a grocery store within the next five years. My time before you today will, will only allow me to provide a snapshot of FY22 performance for the Office on African American Affairs. But each and every day, my team and I, along with our many government and community partners, work very hard to make sure that the prosperity that we are currently experiencing as a city is inclusive and that we connect some of the most vulnerable members of our city with the tools that they need to fully participate and to succeed. In FY22, MOA expanded its capacity, community engagement, visibility, and service throughout the city to provide programs and services that focus on economic inequities, health disparities, and educational advancement for African Americans. During the pandemic, MOA engaged over 400 community-based organizations and businesses with opportunities for grant funding, programs, and resources. Interacting with the community continued with MOA attending more than 100 virtual community events, engaging more than 4,000 residents. MOA has increased its social media presence and has more than 10,000 newsletter subscribers. Additionally, MOA continued to promote African American history and culture through events celebrating Kwanzaa, Black History Month, DC Emancipation Day, Black Business Month, DMV Black Restaurant Week, and Juneteenth. MOA continued providing financial literacy resources and information through the Financially Fit DC workshop series on Black generational wealth building. MOA engaged more than 800 residents providing information on home ownership, investing, financial literacy, personal finance, and information on how to build wealth. Additionally, in an effort to support and promote Black businesses in the district, MOA hosted a Summer Black Business Expo at the Anacostia Art Center and sought to encourage and support community engagement with businesses east of the river. Lastly, we supported DMV Black Restaurant Week, which included conversations and food at the Anacostia Art Center, along with site visits to various restaurants all over the District of Columbia. We truly look forward to continuing our engagement and partnerships with restaurants, both new and historic, in FY23. FY22 was the fourth year of MOA's African American Community Grant Program, and MOA awarded $110,000 in grant funding to 12 community-based organizations providing direct services to Washington, D.C.'s African American community. The African American Community Grant provided residents dance and cultural arts enrichment for youth, entrepreneurship training and mentorship for high schools, college readiness and academic mentoring for students applying for college, food access and health resources for residents in Ward 7 and Ward 8, physical fitness and educational mentoring for youth, academic mentoring and civic engagement for Ward 8 students, an artist and residency program, cultural arts and food access for Ward 7 residents, and resource and technical assistance for African American businesses. The funding areas were education, jobs and economic development, public safety, civic engagement, health and wellness, youth engagement, and arts and the creative economy. Most fiscal year FY22 grantees were the Alliance of Concerned Men, which provided outreach, prevention, and intervention, social services, and cultural enrichment, and recreational activities for low income, at risk youth, and families within the District of Columbia. The Boys and Girls Club of Greater Washington, which provides boys and girls of all backgrounds, confidence building skills, character development, and acquire skills to become productive, civic minded, and responsible adults. Bright Beginnings 
which is dedicated to meeting the immediate needs of children and families experiencing homelessness by providing children with safe, nurturing educational environment, preparing children to enter kindergarten ready to learn, and supporting parents in stabilizing their lives and becoming self-sufficient. Building bridges across the river, or building bridges, which provides residents with the Anacostia River access to the best in-class facilities, programs and partnerships in arts and culture, economic opportunity, education, recreation, health, and well-being. The Congress Heights Community Training and Development, which was founded for the purpose of improving the quality of life of DC residents in economically depressed areas by providing employment opportunities that would aid in the reduction of unemployment and underemployment by promoting self-sufficiency. The DC Affordable Law Firm, which provides legal services to DC residents who do not qualify for traditional forms of free aid and cannot afford the cost of legal representation. DC Strings Workshop, which works to build community and expand horizons by engaging diverse audiences, supplying instruments to deserving students and working to expose students and adults alike to music, of women and underrepresented people of color. The Anacostia Playhouse, which provides immersion and established artists work to do DC traditionally underserved Ward 8 community. As a community oriented performing art space, they present original theater and youth programs, provide a space for partners to showcase their artistic work and host neighborhood events. Through their efforts, they are preserving East of the River's cultural identity while building bridges with with the non East River neighbors, Dreaming Out Loud, which is rebuilding urban community-based food systems throughout through cooperative social enterprise, increasing access to healthy food, improving community health, supporting entrepreneurs and cooperatives from low-income communities, and creating opportunities for at-risk residents to earn sustainable family-supporting wages and build wealth. The East of the River Clergy Police Community Partnership, which through a collaboration of clergy, police, and community, aim to improve the spiritual and personal development of young people and build a system of community support that enhances service delivery and creates healthy and, self and safe neighborhoods. The Dance Institution of Washington, which at the School of Dance and at partner locations, Students ages 2 to 22 receive pre-professional training in classical ballet and diverse dance disciplines, coupled with dance health, nutrition, academic enrichment, life skills, mentoring, and workforce development. And finally, the Young Men's Christian Association of Metropolitan Washington, which aims to foster the spiritual, mental, and physical development of individuals, families, and communities, according to the ideals of inclusiveness, equality, and mutual respect for all. MOA continues to work with partner agencies to create an impactful programs that connect residents to a fair shot and a recovery focused on health, equity, opportunity, and prosperity. I'll spend the next several minutes discussing FY22 activities of the Commission on Fathers, Men, and Boys, which, as I mentioned earlier, is staffed by MOA. The Commission on Father, Men, and Boys was established in 2014 by the council for the purpose of addressing fatherlessness and disparities in educational and economic opportunity, health and well-being, and public safety that adversely impacts fathers, men, and boys in the District of Columbia. Furthermore, the Commission on Father, Men, and Boys works to advise the mayor, the council, and the public on issues and needs of fathers, men, and boys in the District of Columbia. It is a 12-member body that represents multiple generations of DC residents who are community activists, executive directors, entrepreneurs, university professors, and judicial scholars. Under the mayor's leadership, we deliberately reimagined the makeup of the commission to ensure it reflects the demographics of the district. For the first time, CFMB consists of prominent business and community leaders and individuals certified in fatherhood training or having documented experience working directly with issues of particular interest and concern to fathers, men, and boys. I thank the committee for recently holding confirmation hearings for such outstanding individuals. Thank you, Councilmember White. After electing a new chair, the commission successfully convened at least six times between the months of April and August 2022 with most meetings reaching a quorum. Recommendations 
from the commission help create programs to design to address the pandemic impact on males and help create a safe space for men to stay connected and uplift each other in partnership with the African American Male Walk Wellness Walk Initiative, we hosted regular check-ins. During the check-ins, many of the men expressed their gratitude and appreciation for a safe place and time to discuss openly their experiences with loneliness, depression, and the racial tension in our country. Lastly, the commission partnered with many organizations and departments to help improve the lives of fathers, men, and boys. Two examples stand out. First, School activations were highlighted as an important time to be present, and the commission participated in three activations across the district to ensure male representation was visible and supporting boys on their first day of school and beyond. Second, the Office on African American Affairs and the Mayor's Office of Returning Citizens Affairs, in partnership with the commission, hosted a father's rights workshop to provide legal services to fathers in need of support, employment, and resources to overall be better fathers and men at home and in their community. This will certainly continue in FY23. I'm excited about the future of the commission, which will continue quarterly community engagements, meetings, and recommend policies and programs. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my testimony. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today Thank you for your support of our work. I look forward to answering any questions from the committee. Thank you. I appreciate you, uh, Director Bowen, and um, just your leadership since uh, you took this leadership role in dual capacity uh, for the office and for the commission. And just your continuous work in the community. Um, you shared some very powerful words at the Ward 7 and 8 Faith Leaders Breakfast um, last month. I mean, we appreciate every time you come and represent Mayor Bowser um, with the faith-based community. Uh, always a, a breath of fresh air. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. In your testimony, you discussed adding, uh, I think, 20,000 additional Black DC resident homeowners uh, by 2030 and the growing medium income from Black households about 25,000. Um, this is a very... Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Ambitious. Hopeful. Yeah, ambitious goal. You know, um, we are on the edge, if not in a recession right now, um, and facing some tremendous challenges, even with our local government. Um, I just want to let you know, um, we, anyway, we can be helpful with my office um, and the partners in the community. Uh, we would do just that. Um, and we would like to be included on that as, as I am as you know, intricately involved in, 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 in grassroots community, especially when it comes to education, economic empowerment. Um, and I do see that Mayor Bowser has a special fund for black homeowners. Uh, do you have a role in that at all? Uh, thank you, our council member. And, and once again, I truly value your, your support of the office and, and, and the work. And it's always a pleasure to see you also in the community advocating on behalf of our residents. I, I had the privilege and the honor of serving with individuals from uh, around our city on the Black Home Ownership Strike, strike Force um, that developed the recommendations um, that was presented to uh, the, the, the mayor. Um, and, and, and that, you know, how we advise the mayor on how to, to spend uh, that initial $10 million uh, towards um, the, the goal. And I'll highlight the initial $10 million. Um, but it's important to understand um, that there are, are many who perhaps would, would think, you know, whose responsibility, responsibility it is. It is our responsibility uh, now to try to, to counteract um, some of the historical things that have been done um, to residents in Washington, um, D.C. and throughout uh, the country. Uh, part of the task um, also is getting the community uh, involved at every level to get their, their feedback and then to let them know about the opportunities that is, exist. I'm hopeful um, that some of the investments for legal services that would allow families to better negotiate on, on what they should do with mom, dad, and grand, granddad, grandma's house um, will help keep um, homes in, in the hands of, of Black families. Um, we, we need to face uh, those challenges. We need to reach out, as my office um, has done, to young people 
Um, I believe um, that um, young people in our in our city, ages 20 to 30, are the ones who we need to, to bring into the conversation about home ownership. Um, I was excited at one of the workshops that we had at the MLK Library. There was a young lady who had just graduated from Howard and was on her way to Georgetown Medical School. I had spoken with her father in looking for housing, and we said, uh, she shouldn't get an apartment. She just think about buying a home. So there she is on her way to Georgetown Medical School, looking at a home. So that's um, what we're also what we what we wrap around as a, a black home ownership uh, club. Um, there, there are many folk that we run into, 35 and under, who are homeowners, uh, and, and that should be exciting um, for us. The mayor quickly points out that um, there are plenty areas in D.C. Um, that have homes that are affordable. And so we're having those real conversations with the people that we, we come in contact with. Thank you. I think plenty is a, uh, a stretch, uh, especially talking about affordable in DC. Um, and we're doing our due diligence to uh, use all types of initiatives and programs. Uh, one of the ones we're using um, is the Douglas Community Land Trust here in Ward 8 to uh, essentially um, deepen the level of affordability uh, with homeowners um, in the district. I mean, that's all people, but I know we have a, a interest for African-American people trying to buy homes as well and keep them affordable so they can still live and grow uh, their families here. Um, we also, oh, I'm also interested, if you get anything like that um, about you having anything, please share it with me, even if you got to text it to me so I can get it out. Um, in my weekly newsletter and or my social media so people are aware and can grasp it. I know sometimes we get the information through the mayor's office um, or through her newsletter, uh, but that'd be beneficial. We all can be sharing opportunity and resources. Um, I'm gonna just say this, Director Bowen, um, I had the opportunity to go visit the young man, um, his name is out there now, but the 13 year old young man, Cardell, uh, who was killed, uh, on Chesapeake Street two nights ago. Um, and I can tell you um, that we have a mighty task ahead when we talk about the correlation between father, fathers, uh, men and boys, especially of African-American and Latino descent here in the district. Um, in the last two, three months, I know Yukia, and Yukia Wilson and I from my staff have visited a number of families who are struck who are saddened and you know traumatized by the ongoing violence. Um, and it's not just happening with our boys, it's also happening uh, with our females, our young ladies, our, our adult ladies um, in the community. Um, and so I wanted to talk to you briefly about that. Um, we, we, we heard what happened yesterday up at Coolidge and I don't want you to speak on that, but uh, what is your thoughts from an agency uh, perspective on uh, the youth and adult violence, especially among African-Americans here in the district? Yeah, this is not something uh, new um, to me. Um, prior to coming to my position in the mayor's office, I spent uh, a dozen years um, at Shiloh Baptist Church as their youth minister, interacted with youth who are not only members of congregation, but our youth are the ones who, who lived in Shaw, who, who came through our doors, who engaged in our after school um, program. Um, those are the things that I, I continue to, to tout the people in the community um, for our, our youth, our responsibility, each and every one of us. I told people at the church um, that you forfeit your right to talk about uh, youth unless you are doing something to help our youth. Um, I'm glad for our investments in the Office of Gun Violence Prevention. They're doing a great work um, there, but they need our, our support. Um, you cannot give children too much love. And I so also love the programs that we have through, through DPR. I love what the school system is doing. But what we continue to hear, we heard most recently at one of the community forums we had with the ANC, is that we, and I take this as responsibility of my job, and it's what you were talking about. We have to do a better job of getting information out there. Oftentimes, there are people looking for things that don't even know they already exist. But it's going to take all of us to work, um, to prioritize our young people. It's gonna take the faith community to open up its doors to um, young people. And our young people need to be exposed to certain opportunities, which 
I like what our community grant program does, exposing them. You saw one of the programs that the kid could not afford strings and they will buy the string instrument for them. But we have to continue to invest um, in our, our young people. We also um, know that we need to do more in terms of addressing the mental health needs of, of young people. Um, and so I'm, I'm happy also that we're, we're, we're doing a great job of taking away the stigma uh, attached to mental um, health. I believe that um, a person seeking and uh, engaged in mental health is a sign of strength. Um, but that's why I like I'm working um, with you in the community because we're going to do anything and everything that we need uh, to help um, our our young people. And I, I have to say this because I was present at the Village Cafe on yesterday um, for the uh, kickoff of the application process of the Marionberry Summer Youth Employment um, Program, um, which offers a job to any young person in the district who wants a job. The application uh, went live. We're encouraging all young people to apply. Um, for those jobs. Those, those jobs not only provide a paycheck, uh, but in many cases, it allow our young people to engage um, with, with, with adults responsible, um, adults who can act as mentors for those um, um, young people. Um, so the investments that I named and some of the other investments are what we need to continue to do and have a personal relationship um, with young people and interact, interact with them. I agree with that. And I do... Um think we have to get the information out more. And as you know, I oversee uh, DPR and trying to make sure um, we uh, give opportunities to those who have uh, lack of access to, to the digital uh, media or to internet, for lack of better words. Um, because you know, there's, there's a barrier and a disparity when it comes to access, being able to even sign up. And to you know, um, take away some of the, the the barriers over the we've taken away some of the barriers over the years. Like, you know, um, there's no need to submit a, a birth certificate and social security card if you already been in in some job before, um, because it, it does it doesn't change. Um, and I know they are now coordinating with schools uh, to streamline some of the required documents, which was historically barriers to entry into some job. We. I do want to note that we also having a youth hearing um, coming up. Uh, I think it's um, February the 25th at 12 p.m. Uh, at the Rise Center, which is at, for those who are listening, at 2730 Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue, because we have to be intentional about giving our youth a, a voice and also not just listening to them, but taking their suggestions, incorporating uh, that with policy, with budget, uh, and we're programming, um, and it's you know it's important that we do this. That again, that hearing is on February the twenty fifth, twelve noon, at twenty three twenty seven thirty MLK uh, here in Ward eight. Um, and so, Director, well, thank you for sharing sharing the summer youth pro program information. Um, as Black Re Black History Month uh, begins tomorrow, uh, what are your plans? What plans do your office have um, in upcoming? months and in addition can you let us know which events you will have throughout dc and also particularly ward eight if you can speak to that if you have any plans for black history month yeah thank you for uh, that uh question we're we're on the eve of black history month and i like what mayor bowser always says we celebrate black history every day because there's so much black history um to celebrate it's along those lines um that we will also um through our social media campaign, we highlight each and every day um, a site uh, in Washington, um, D.C., where Black history um, has uh, been made. Um, there is another group that we've worked with that has 51 stops, 51 is intentional here, yeah, um, stops uh, in D.C. where one can celebrate um, Black history. And some of those stops will and are located uh, in Ward 8. We're going to make sure that we also um, highlight our history in the making, that's our young people. So we've identified four young people. I'm, I'm not gonna get my staff uh, mad at me by releasing those names now, but there are four young people in the District of Columbia that we're gonna highlight who are history makers in the making. We're also gonna have a discussion around black political power. Um, as you know, uh, our, our mayor is, is the first um, African-American woman elected to three consecutive four-year terms. And that's, and that's something to highlight. We cannot uh, forget about uh, 
uh, Marion and Barry, but we also have to be um, real about where we are. Um, and there are many uh, people who are, are talking um, uh, about going back uh, to, to, to the home rule. We want to educate the community uh, what took place in home rule as we try to move the ball down the field um, to, to, state head, to statehood. Uh, another one of the things that we'll um, be doing in the month of February um, is, is, is having, once again, a Black home ownership uh, workshop series, which we're going to uh, kick off. Um, we'll kick off that that workshop that will put us towards the goal that we had talked about earlier. Um, you know, when you look um, at the Black community um, in D.C. and then and, and look um, at, at what how life and the choices you make were related to employment and home ownership. Um, we, we know that this will, will help us um, to celebrate Black culture and life in, in D.C. Um, my fellow director in the office of Night Life and Culture um, will be having events uh, around go go music, the official uh, music of DC. Um, but you also look at what the library will offer and DC public schools will um, um, will offer for Black History uh, Month. Um, but I'll be sure to give you a listing of of our signature events um, for um, Black History Month. There's over 30 events planned uh, here in Washington uh, DC. But once Thank again, you. as Mary said, we celebrate Black History every month um, and every day because there's a lot of Black in D.C. to celebrate. I totally agree with that. I'm going to thank you for that. Um, while you're talking about events, um, and this is a father, men, boys question uh, regarding uh, the African-American Male Wellness Walk Initiative. Uh, are you doing that this year? Um, and are you planning to expand it? Uh, could you give us some inf information on, on that program that you all administer? Yeah, one of the, the, the beauty, once again, of, of combining um, offices and enhancing um, our resources is that it'll allow us um, to have a better reach. So one of the things that I did not um, lift up is that we're partnering with um, the Deputy Mayor for Health and Human Services to have uh, Black Health Matters um, resource fair. Um, to provide um, services, um, DBH um, will be there to talk about uh, better ways to, to address um, our, our mental health. As a part of that resource fair, we're able to bring um, uh, the commission um, into that. I um, don't know if we will participate in that same initiative uh, this year, but we will certainly be addressing the needs of, of, of Black mental health and convening um, groups of individuals and doing all that we can to support um, fathers, men, and boys uh, in the the district. We 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 have to look at what we how we define masculinity in the district. We have to uh, understand that the people who who perceive we perceive as being the strongest are the ones we need to check in with each and every day and give them the resources and the skills they need need to know to deal with growing up uh, as a, a a male, as a father, a boy in our city. So it is a priority for sure. I appreciate that. Um, and it's, I want to know this because one of we we've in, in this office we've tried to support, uh, especially uh, our, our male population and also female population in the district through putting additional resources with officer out of school time. Um, do you work at all with that agency in any in any capacity? I think I missed that. Which agency? Officer out of school time. Um, we have been involved in discussions and, and meetings um, with them. We, we know of some of the activations um, that, that they have. I think that's part of the work um, that I mentioned where we um, brought the commission um, together at the beginning of the school year uh, to make sure that we welcome um, boys um, back into school. Um, so it's in that vein that, yes, we will be, be working because we all understand that out of school time is an important time. That, that walk after school as a, as a D.C. native and author, Jason Reynolds, Crowns on his book, is an important time. Um, so we look to do more um, in, in working with them. And, and, and final question, Director, um, what are some of the major concerns that you hear from constituents that we need? that need most help that you can say to the city council and especially those on this committee that we can be helpful with if, if there is any well for me it's, it's a personal one um i live in trinidad um i ride the the x2 uh to work each and every day 
uh, and, and when I hear um, folk and see folk, I'm looking at um, projects and development and expressing a CERN that is not for them. I, I actually just want to grab the mic and say it is for you. So we have to make folk understand, believe, and know um, that the prosperity that we're currently experiencing is for them and that they have a place and a space in Washington, D.C. DC, the folk who have historically been here, maintained and lived in our communities are the people that we need to address um, their very real concerns in a major and, and mighty um, way. So for me, it's about how do we not just maintain, but rebuild community. The African proverb that says it takes a village to raise a child has a major assumption, and that assumption is a village is a healthy one, and we have yep. to make sure our village is healthy. Thank you, Director, um, for engaging us today. We look forward to working with you and figuring out ways to advance services for your agency and for the committee. Thank you, and thank you, committee. Give me one second. There's a helicopter hovering where I am, so it might be a little, I'm just trying to give it a look a few seconds. Hey, Director Guzman, how are you? Uh, good afternoon, sir. I'm doing well. Good, good to see you. Good to see you. All right. Um, you're next up on the on the on the agenda, um, and for those who don't know, uh, Director Ben De Guzman uh, is the director for Asian and, and Pacific Islander Affairs, um, also known as Moapia. Yep. <laughs> all right. Um, we it is a practice of this office to swear in all government witnesses, so you can start by raising your right hand. Uh, is there anyone else from your staff to be will be speaking at all? Uh, no. Uh, we have our uh, budget person on hand if there's uh, specific questions, but other, uh, but we don't anticipate, um, it's just me. Okay, great. Um, you can stop raising your right hand, we can get started. Do you swear or affirm on the penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give today is the truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you, you can go right ahead if what you're opening statement. Thank you, uh, Council Member White. Um, and thank you to the other council members who are here as well. Um, before I begin my um, official written testimony as submitted, I did wanna wish you all a happy Lunar New Year. <laughs> Nine days ago, we joined uh, Mayor Bowser, uh, Council Chair Mendelssohn, and about 10,000 of our friends um, in Chinatown um, in person for the first time since 2020 uh, to welcome the Year of the Rabbit, um, or as our Vietnamese friends celebrate the Year of the Cat. Um, even as we were hearing news about a mass shooting that was happening in Monterey Park, California, and as we would hear later news about an additional shooting in Half Moon Bay, California. So, you know, it was a day of emotions for us. Um, and I think those emotions, both of hope for the new year, but also of mindfulness of the challenges that are still in front of us. Um, I think that spirit informs the testimony that I will provide for you today. So I thank you for indulging me in that little uh, preface there. But uh, good afternoon. Um, as you said, my name is Ben DeGuzman and I'm honored to serve Mayor Muriel Bowser as the director for the Mayor's Office on Asian and Pacific Islander Affairs. Um, as you said, we uh, are also known as Moapia and um, thank you. I wanted to thank you for the opportunity to testify today regarding the performance of Moapia in fiscal year 2022, and to share with you some highlights of our current performance in the fiscal year to date of 2023. Um, uh, Moapia's mission is to improve the quality of life for Asian American and Pacific Islander residents of the District of Columbia through advocacy and engagement. For over 35 years, we've played the twofold role of 
One, representing the office of the mayor to the AAPI community and providing information about city government resources. And two, advocating for the AAPI community in city government, ensuring that all residents have equitable access to public agencies and their services, regardless of their race, ethnicity, national origin, or immigrant status. To uh, accomplish our mission, we provide three core services. One, assisting all district AAPI residents in accessing services from district agencies and advocating for the issues affecting their quality of life, regardless of where in the AAPI community they come from. Two, assisting district agencies with building their capacity to provide culturally and linguistically competent services to districts uh, to the district's AAPI community. And three, continuing to provide the AAPI community with access to grant funding to support their unique needs, whether in the community or in the district's business sector. According to uh, recent statistics, the API population grew to uh, 46,959 residents, about 6.8% of the entire district population in 2021. This was about a 60% increase from 2000. Um, uh, most of our population is concentrated in wards two and three, although it's increasing in all the other wards. And obviously we have vibrant populations in all eight wards. Along with that population increase, the number of Asian-owned businesses is rapidly growing as well. Um, in 2012, the survey of business owners from the Census Bureau reported that there were a total of almost 4,000 Asian-owned businesses um, in the district producing over $2 billion of revenue, which is a 15.4% 15 15 increase in the number of those businesses and a 16% increase in revenue compared to 2007. The most recent census data also indicates that 2% of the district's population, of the entire population, speak Asian and Pacific Islander languages at home, and 23% of the Asian American households in the district have limited English proficiency. So nationally, it's also recognized that AAPIs are the fastest growing racial and ethnic group in the country. For FY22, Moapia exceeded all of our key performance indicators, meeting all of our goals regarding performance metrics. The level of performance has become our standard and that we've continued to meet year in and year out. Some of the highlights of our work in FY22 included um, our work on COVID-19 relief and recovery efforts in a dynamic response to the evolving nature of the pandemic, um, increasing our in-person programming and helping reconnect communities and uh, developing and executing a multi-pronged work plan to address anti-Asian violence in the district. In terms of our COVID-19 relief and recovery efforts, we reached 2,843 uh, API owned small businesses in all eight wards to provide the latest updates regarding the rapidly changing policies around masks and vaccinations, um, as well as relief programs such as the Bridge Fund and the DEMPED Small uh, Medium Business Fund. Um, our staff continue to provide support to 220 applicants from residents and business owners for COVID recovery programs like Stay DC, SBA loans, and unemployment benefits. As city policies regarding public meetings and mask requirements changed over the course of the pandemic, we began to resume our in-person events and our um, uh, in-person outreach. In FY22, we hosted 20 in-person events, partnering with 45 public and private partners. Some of these major events included Diwali, um, our holiday toy celebration, our Lunar New Year celebration, our Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, um, our Food Delicious Night, um, and our Chinatown Park Summer Series, um, which included five additional um, individual events throughout the summer. A total of 11,397 residents attended those activities. We celebrated our 35th anniversary during August of FY22, and we were able to bring the past, present, and future together. Mayor Bowser provided a rousing keynote address. Um, I had a virtual fireside chat with some of my uh, predecessors 
to this office going back to the first special assistant who was hired by Mary and Barry and stood up our office for the first time in 1987. And uh, also the event also included the commission on Asian and Pacific Islander community development and the presentation they made um, on the activities and recommendations for the mayor moving forward for the next 35 years. Um, a hallmark of our work over, the, over these 35 years in service has been meeting the community where they are, whether it's geographically or figuratively. We're out in the community visiting constituents um, a minimum of twice a week. At the same time, our staff maintain multilingual capacity in the four Asian languages spoken by the largest populations of limited English proficient immigrant communities. So Mandarin and Cantonese that are Chinese languages, Korean and Vietnamese. Our staff also have additional language proficiency in Filipino and Spanish, which were on full display in the fall of 2021 when Moapia hosted two vaccination clinics with the Filipino Nurses Association, the DC chapter of the um, Nurses Association, the Iglesia Ni Cristo, and the Philippine Embassy. At two clinics in October and December, we provided boosters and vaccinations to over 400 participants, including Mayor Bowser and former council member um, Brandon Todd. To ensure equal access to limited English proficient constituents, our staff translated over 300 documents into Chinese, Vietnamese, and Korean, reaching over 1,700 constituents. As a key agency providing linguistic competence across city government, we reviewed the work of more than 30 agencies and provided technical assistance to them to make sure that they remain in, in compliance with the DC Language Access Act. We also provided cultural competency training for 182 staff in two agencies. We worked to promote the Summer Youth Employment Program among the AAPI community. We translated information about the program and delivered it to the community by ethnic media, door-to-door -door outreach, social media, and our newsletters. Our bread and butter program, though, continues to be the work our outreach team does on a daily basis. Between engaging residents directly who approach our office um, and needing help and proactively providing the latest information about resources and government activities for businesses that are owned by Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, we went the distance to serve our residents and businesses. We took on more than 900 cases, um, including over 700 for limited English proficient individuals. Uh, we made 3,621 calls to businesses and residents, resulting in 5,716 outreach efforts to residents. We visited 533 businesses in all eight wards and had 2,843 separate engagements. Our key, one key accomplishment that uh, we achieved was our groundbreaking Hate Stops With Us campaign to oppose anti-Asian violence in the district. With a strategic investment from the mayor and in consultation with community stakeholders, we developed a three-pronged plan to reaffirm DC values around tolerance and acceptance. A training component uh, brought anti-Asian hate curriculum to almost 250 trainees across city government, including DC public schools and other city agencies across uh, the course of 10 trainings. Community engagement was another prong um, and we raised awareness about the problems API residents and business owners face because of the national rise of violence, including our four quarterly community meetings. And finally, we implemented a media strategy with the hashtag hate stops with us uh, that created compelling images of our staff, of government leaders and of community advocates with messages of unequivocal opposition to hate in all its forms. The campaign appeared across the city from larger than life electronic billboards in um, our Chinatown, uh, right across from our historic friendship arch to the Nationals baseball stadium, to Capitol bike share kiosks around the city and internet ads for local news websites. And we got 625,000 impressions and uh, 1600 clicks alone via the online application ads. Our robust social media presence helped amplify and disseminate these messages 
for hashtag hate stops with us. Overall for FY22, our primary social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram experienced an increase of 11% in our followers. We reach over 27,500 followers over our social media platforms and our newsletter, our newsletter continues to have an active and engaged readership reaching 9,196 subscribers. Our website traffic also increased in FY22, growing 67% over um, FY21 to reach 9,540 hits. The mission of Moabi, as I said before, is to improve the quality of life for district residents. And uh, we do that, th one of the uh, final ways that I'll talk about the way we do that is through our community grant program. We make strategic investments to reach AAPI constituents through DC-based nonprofits um, uniquely suited with the skills and expertise to reach those constituencies. In FY22, we awarded a total of $213,302 to, uh, in grants to community-based organizations to support API communities. For the fiscal year, the grantees served a total of 11,926 constituents. The cohort of 10 grantees in our program included longstanding partners of ours with decades of experience, as well as new grantees providing services in programs we hadn't uh, provided recently, such as voter registration and a partnership with the Japanese America Society of Washington, DC. Public safety has been a priority um, issue for the community over the course of the fiscal year and has evolved over the past few years in the re response to the pandemic. Chinatown has often been talked about as the legacy home of the district's API community, but the challenges that face our Chinatown arise from a unique confluence of circumstances in the Gallery Place neighborhood. In response to both national trends of assault against APIs and COVID-19 economic impacts on the businesses and residents of Gallery Place in Chinatown, new patterns of crime and other public safety challenges are emerging. Part of the challenge for Moapia then is how we adapt to the evolving nature of how crime and discrimination intersect in our Chinatown and leverage the appropriate governmental and community resources and responses to address those who are visiting harm upon the residents and the business owners that are there. For almost two years, we've been at the forefront of the government agencies and resources that have been brought to bear in response to COVID-19. From the very beginning of the pandemic, even before the declaration of a official public health emergency, when businesses in Chinatown first began to suffer from the economic downturn, um, to the work that we've done to address the wave of anti-Asian violence, um, we really have been the canary in the coal mine in the fight against COVID-19 in the District of Columbia. In FY23, we'll continue to innovate and be proactive in responding to the evolving nature of the challenges that current circumstances and the latest stages of COVID-19 present. Service in the face of adversity has been our hallmark for the 35 years we've been in existence and our work in FY22 demonstrates that we're ready for the next 35 years. In closing, I just wanted to thank you, Councilmember White, for your leadership and support. We appreciate the opportunity to share our uh, accomplishments and our plans for continuous improvement and look forward to continuing the work with you and the committee. Uh, this concludes my presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have at this time. Great, uh, thank you, Director Guzman. I think it's always helpful um, during performance oversight to hear uh, the work and the data and numbers and just the impact um, our government agencies are tasked to do. I think that we have a responsibility to taxpayers in DC um, to talk about progress. You know, as you know, um, the DC budget has grown what a, a billion dollars every year for the last five years, and so. I think that we have uh, due diligence to show how those resources are being used and what programming, and you've done an extensive job explaining a lot of that during your testimony. Um, and so I'm gonna give, I'm gonna tell me about I'm gonna give you a thumbs up for your leadership. Thanks a lot. <laughs> um, but, but I think that some of the things you all do may go unnoticed. Uh, and I don't know if you remember this, but there was a, a incident um, 
on Sixth Street Southeast at a local store um, uh, owned by Asian resident um, who was having some controversy with the community about a painting. Mm -hmm. And I was excited to see this division within the Metropolitan Police Department that came out um, doing that, not to, you know, uh, be overly aggressive or enforce anything, but to sh have support um, for the community and for the store owner. And that was a chance for me to see your office in action. And I want to thank uh, you and your leadership and your staff for doing that. And I just want to note, in case you didn't know, that that mural is back up. Good. Um, for uh, Miss China, and it's very beautiful. Um, so shout out to Wink, who was the artist who took, didn't hesitate to come back and do the mural all over again. And no, that's great. It, it it is actually. You ask if I remember it. I, I remember it. It is a story that we continue to tell. Because I think it really encapsulates a lot of the work that we do to do on the front end to make sure that misunderstandings and cultural miscues don't blow up and become much larger things down the road, right? So just a very simple um, intervention at the beginning of the process when people were trying to figure each other out um, saved a lot of people a lot of heartache. So uh, we, were, we were glad to be able to be part of the solution. Great, great. Thank you. And I want to shout out Jovan from Love More and also the Lines of Concernment for helping uh, to mediate that. Um, I know um, there has been a 6.8% uh, AAPI uh, population growth. Um, and I just wanted to hear from you. What are your thoughts on ensuring that we are, as a government are expanding our services to reach the increase in the community, community services? Yeah, you know, um, I mean, I think that part of it is what you've talked about and what, you know, my uh, uh, colleagues who preceded me, uh, Director Kaba and uh, Director Bowen, have talked about in the sense of um, not enough people knowing about our work, right? So whether it's because of the linguistic challenges uh, that we always work on, you know, our residents who don't speak English and who would not otherwise know about the government services that are, um, that can be plentiful here if you know where to look. Um, but also, you know, um, as Reverend Bowen and, and you pointed to, you know, sometimes people just don't know about the things that, you know, we're able to do. And so I think we really want to make sure that we're identifying different facets of the community, um, you know, continuing to work with the partners that we already have, but finding different constituencies to engage. Um, and, you know, because that 6.9% is not insignificant, right? And we want to figure out kind of who they are and what are the best ways to reach them, you know? Thank you. Uh, one of the things you just alluded to was about language barriers and resources and communication. Um, do you see any uh, growing or concern about uh, our schools and our ability to educate and reach and help empower young people in our schools who are having language barriers at all? You know, um, I think that it's, it's, a, it's a challenge that we have faced, you know, for a long time, right? I mean, the immigrant community that is in this city, you know, have had kids that have come through the system for the 35 years that we've been around, right? And we've done our best with the resources that we've had um, over the course of that time to meet the students where they are, um, to make sure that they, that their needs are being met. Um, because even if they speak English well or not, um, they become conduits for their parents, right? So they're often the ones that are helping their parents navigate some of the services. And they're the ones that are telling their parents about stuff that they hear about, you know, on the news or from their friends or whatever. So, you know, I think we're um, trying to figure out the best way to support our students that are in the school system. Um, but yeah, I think that's another one of the challenges I think that's in front of us, especially as we are coming out of 
the pandemic and as, as students are beginning, you know, have been back in school. But one of the things we do know is that Asian students were more likely to um, stay home as long as they could. You know, their parents, when given the option, um, and this happened that, with my family. What do you think that is, what, what do you think that is attributed to? Um, you know, I think part of it is some of the um, some of the experience that folks from Asian countries have had with respect to COVID-19 and yeah. bird flu and like, you know, you go to Asia and people are used to wearing masks, right? Okay. And so I think we have looked at the pandemic in different ways. Honestly, some of the stuff around the violence that's happened against our communities. Yeah, yeah. I want to ask you about that um, because I know early, earlier during the pandemic, I was reading, man, story after story about just discrimination, assaults um, here in America on Asians and Asian Americans. Um, and I haven't seen much lately, but just because I haven't seen it don't mean it's not occurring. Uh, do you think that's still happening? And just want to get your thoughts on that and what we can be doing as a district to ensure that we are making people feel safe and utilizing our resources to be an outlet and uh, any sort of help. Mm-hmm. Uh, I literally got a call yesterday wow. from someone um, in the federal government. You know, like we think about the fe- when people think about D.C. who don't live here, they think about the Hill, they think about Congress or the White House or whatever. Um, but those folks live in the district. Right. And they're subject to the same things that we face. So, you know, I got a call yesterday from someone who, you know, um, had someone, you know, kind of, you know, um, and, you know, sometimes these things aren't, don't amount to crimes per se. Sometimes they're uh, verbal assaults. Sometimes they're, you know, so reporting becomes weird sometimes. And so, you know, we've been encouraging people to, you know, call MPD, obviously, when you need to, but also call 311 when you need to report things to the Office of Human Rights when that's appropriate. You know, we benefit from the fact that we have a range of ways to think about how to address the kinds of issues that our residents are facing. And so, you know, it's just a, it's a question of making sure that everybody has the best information. Thank you. Um, Have you, uh, how how have the Asian owned businesses uh, benefited? from the bridge fund um, and then pay a small medium business fund. Um, and are you directly involved with that? Yeah, our office has um, uh, helped uh, residents and uh, business owners apply for those grants. Um, I know I mentioned them in my testimony. I don't ha- offhand have the specific numbers of how many, I think it was uh, the applications that we provided uh, that we helped people submit for both of those programs. But, you know, um, my staff who provide, you know, in language support for like the Korean business owner who would have trouble filling that out if it weren't for the help of our staff, you know, um, they tell that, you know, they report about how grateful the business owners are, not just that these opportunities exist, uh, but that we have an office like ours that can help make sure that they fill out the the application. Because you could have all the grant money in the world available, but if you don't know that it's there, you're going to leave that money on the table. So we help make sure that people don't leave money on the table. Got it. Got it. Um, And I wanted to also ask uh, about in light of the recent horrific events um, uh, that you've had discussing public safety at your at your large in-person events like the Lunar New Year, AAPI Heritage Month, and others, what kind of measures have been in place to, uh, to for this year's safety, right? And what are your future plans? We know it's just in general, there's been an uptick in violence. And in fact, we had a 22 year high in the last three years and COVID a number of other you know we're seeing mass even and I'm not trying to in, insinuate fear or anything I just want to make sure we're erring on a side of caution so I want to get your thoughts about mm-hmm. that no no it's a great question and it's 
it's the question that we are asking ourselves. You know, the morning that I woke up before uh, we went to the Lunar New Year parade, we woke up to the news of what was happening in Monterey Park, right? So I reached out to MPD, I reached out to our parade organizers. You know, we talked about, you know, the level of response that MPD would need to have, the additional presence that they would need to have to make sure that the event went off without a hitch, which it did. Um, thankfully, because uh, the rain could have <laughs> made things yeah. bad also. But, you know, um, we're continuing to ask ourselves that question. You know, what is the, how are we going to best make sure that our um, residents remain safe as we continue to be ambitious about our in-person programming? Um, the, as I said in my testimony, the um, pandemic and its circumstances are evolving, right? Like it's, it's not that we're getting the, you caused COVID, you know, go back to where you came from, mm -hmm. um, those kinds of things anymore, but it is a different kind of, you know, um, it is still happening at higher rates than before the pandemic though. Um, you know, there's been sort of this valve that's been released and people feel more, you know, able to, you know, uh, let out their violent aggressions against the community in ways they weren't before. Um, so even though it's not specifically around COVID, um, it's there. And so how we need to respond to it, um, you know, the, the perpetrators or the alleged, uh, the people who are in custody for Monterey Park and Half Moon Bay um, were Asian American, right? And so, you know, the questions of gun reform are being asked in the community, you know, are, are the gun reform, like, how do we make sure that gun reform laws are best able to keep our residents safe? Because, you know, um, and to what extent, you know, where did the failures happen? Um, and so how do we make sure that those failures don't happen here in DC? Absolutely. Um, I know that you mentioned uh, that the commission um, on Asian and Pacific Islander community development provided a report on activities and recommendations for the mayor moving um, into the next 35 years. Um, what are some of your recommendations and takeaways that you that you receive from that that you can just express here in this hearing and to the public? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I think. Um, well, one is, you know, being nimble around public safety to make sure that we're able to capture the how the challenges of the moment are affecting our community, whether it's hate violence, whether it's gun reform, um, and how to best respond to those. Um, mental health was another challenge that we've identified. Um, you know, our uh, commission held the first um, mental health related program after the public health emergency was declared. So like as early as April, 2020, I think, one of the first WebEx seminars that the city government offered was our commission bringing mental health professionals to talk to our residents about, you know, what mental health looks like in the pandemic. So I would say that mental health is another issue. Um, and then, you know, on a more fundamental level, how do we build community? here in the district, you know, like we, there, we're continually learning about the generations of Asian Americans who have lived here, um, you know, uh, that whose stories we're not telling yet, you know, so people who come here think that they're the first people who came here, but I've mm -hmm. lived here for 30 years, you know, I know people who've lived here for three generations, right. and so how do we make sure that, you um, that people feel like this is a place that they can call home and then they can build their new community here. Got it. Um, I, I wanted to elaborate on my, Myopia's bread and butter program and how it serves residents. Mm -hmm. Our outreach program? Um, well, it's called, I see it labeled as bread and butter program. I don't know what that is. Oh, well, I, I talked about our bread and butter program being our outreach program i think okay okay um as i go through my testimony but uh i mean in terms of our outreach program our uh 
constituents and you know it's uh, bread and butter is more a figurative thing <laughs> than the actual name of our program. Okay, but okay. Our team is literally out in the field every week talking to business owners, making sure they know that the bridge fund is out there, that the other latest, you know, service or resource that's available for them, you know, is able to, um, you know, be taken advantage of. We're going to begin to start promoting the summer youth engagement program as part of our outreach. So um, it is our opportunity to take the most current resources in city government and proactively go in the field and provide them for our business owners. I'm glad you spoke about outreach. I know that in FY22, um, you guys awarded a total of, I guess, $213,000 in grants to community-based organizations that support AAPI communities. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us what type of organizations are there that was awarded? They are that was awarded and what they do. Yeah, so we had uh, ten uh, grantees in 2022. Um, you know, some of them provide really basic human services. Um, the Asian Pacific American Legal Resource Center provides legal support, especially for um, immigrant and low income residents. Uh, our Hep B initiative provides um, health screenings okay. for folks, particularly around hepatitis B, which is um, a condition that disproportionately affects Asian Americans. Um, we had uh, cultural programming, like with a partnership that we did with the Japanese American Society of Washington, DC. Uh, and um, we uh, did a program with, um, where we promoted voter education efforts. Um, you know, to register voters and to make sure that they were able to cast their ballot. Um, those are just some of the work that our grantees did. Um, I can provide you with a more, um, you know, thorough list of our grantees and the work that they did. Got it. Um, are you able to share, I guess, some of the outcomes of their services and programs and any growth efforts as we go into, I guess, preparing for a new budget cycle? Um, yeah, you know, I, I mean, I think in total, we reached about 11,000 um, residents, um, you know, in terms of specific areas of growth and, um, you know, uh, outcomes, um, I can, I can go back and provide you with some further information. But, you know, I think that Again, even during the pan, I think one of the things that we continued to hear from our grantees is just the reality that we were able to keep providing support for them despite the pandemic, um, you know, where a lot of other money was drying up, where a lot of other resources were going away. Uh, the fact that we were still there uh, was, you know, just being in the game was uh, helpful for them. So, you know, it allowed them from keeping, from keeping their lights on, right? From keeping their doors open. So, you know, um, in, a, in an environment where so many nonprofits had to close um, or, you know, go away or what have you, the fact that we were able to work with our cohort um, and make sure that they were able to stay open and continue to do their work um, was important for us. Okay, got it. Um, have you witnessed uh, businesses rebounding from the impact of COVID-19? Because uh, I hear uh, a lot of times in the business community uh, that, you know, they're still suffering, right? Especially mm -hmm. in the hotel and restaurant industry of getting people back in, uh, inconsistencies in staff. Uh, we have a number of office buildings who... Uh, who I guess the occupier of the building has gone to virtual working. And because of that, uh, buildings are slated to uh, go into foreclosure or close its doors because there's no one renewing their leases. Uh, I'm not sure if you are seeing that in your support of the business community. If so, can you speak to that, if any? No, we're totally seeing that. Uh, you know, we... We talked about, I, I talked about the federal government before and the fact that so many of our federal government colleagues, you know, um, are still working from home. 
um, uh, you know, has represented such a challenge to our businesses downtown, right? And uh, obviously that holds true for our, our Asian owned businesses. You know, we, um, not unlike other communities, you know, we've seen businesses that, you know, weren't able to make it through, but we've also seen some of the most successful folks that have been able to roll with the punches and come out on this side of the pandemic, you know, um, thriving. So, you know, uh, we have some success stories, but all too often, you know, like you, I hear no one's coming for lunch, you know, um, Chinatown still is not at its, you know, um, but particularly downtown where all the government agencies yep. are, and, you know, we've seen that downturn still affecting our business owners. Yeah. And I know I, the mayor is calling in support of president Biden to push federal government with workers back to work, mm -hmm. not sure how that's going to, if that's going to happen or not. And if, that if it doesn't happen, what's the, what's the long-term impact? I just know you work closely with the business community. So I wanted to ask you that. Um, and, and knowing that you were going to be here today, um, I guess in closing, right, what are some of your, your top priorities and goals for programming going into FY23? Yeah, you know, um, I think... Uh, they revolve around building community. You know, we, um, you know, on the year that all of these horrific things happened in California, that was the first year that um, the California as a state recognized Lunar New Year as a holiday. Okay. You know, are there different ways in which the city government can acknowledge the API community here? whether it's through increased acknowledgement and celebration of things like Lunar New Year or Diwali, um, whether it's uh, working with our businesses, you know, to promote, um, you know, uh, international business. That's something that uh, some of our uh, stakeholders are talking to us about also. Um, so, you know, but um, I think that there's, a couple of different things that I think we're trying to move forward, um, but ultimately they revolve around connecting um, our folks here in the district together, whether as the mayor has said, whether they've been here for five days or five generations. So for us, maybe it's three generations, but you know, we, we wanna make sure that DC um, is increasingly seen as a place where people can lay down roots. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, just want you to know that our office want to be continuous supportive of expanding uh, programming um, across the district to all ethnicity, age range, groups, uh, even pets, right? Because uh, we oversee the Department of Parks and Recs as well. So if anything we can be helpful with, please let us know. Um, and we want to and we want to be at some of the events as well. I know uh, some additional things have not happened as much or slowed down or just starting back up again. But we would love to be there and support. Um, and I want to thank you for your leadership, Director Guzman, and your team and your staff. And before we go, I want to thank uh, my staff. Uh, my staff has been tremendously helpful. Um, we had some shifts in our organizational chart uh, coming into January, but they picked it up and was able to get us where we needed to be today. And I look forward to um, this year and what this year has to offer. God is good. And so we're just excited about what's to come. On a final note, for this hearing, if anyone um, could not testify, but would like to submit a written testimony to be included in the official record, you can email your testimony to the Committee on Recreation, Library, and Youth Affairs, and that's at ryA at dccouncil.gov. The official record will close today, uh, January 23rd, 20, 31st, 2023, at 5.30 p.m. Um, with no other business before us, uh, before this committee, um, it, the time is now 4.40 p.m. And this meeting is adjourned. Thanks a lot, Councilor. Thank you. Hey, thank you. <clears throat> thank you.